ngalakin kadijen yunga boja. Good evening, everyone. I think we'll make a start. Before we get started, it is customary for the University of Western Australia to acknowledge that its campus is situated on Noongar land, and the Noongar people remain their spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. We'll turn off the mobile phones, please. <laughs> Helen, you, Helen is more tougher than me, so she's going to tell that, but now I did that, Helen. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 18th My Carol Traveling Fellowship Award evening. I think many of you have been here for all the 18 or 17 events. I've got many uh, dignitaries and many friends and senior colleagues here, so I won't name uh, many, but I would like to acknowledge uh, Mrs. Helen Carroll and her lovely daughter, Marie-Louise Carroll. <laughs> And we are, we are training her to take the leadership, right? <laughs> and my Carol supporters, colleagues, and friends, uh, many of you have actually contributed to this uh, bequest, this fellowship, and uh, that has been for a worthy cause, which we will find out pretty soon. Now, a little bit about uh, my Carol. So thanks for the photograph. Uh, we are getting better every year on these kind of things. Many of you know the family, friends, colleagues, and benefactors made donations to establish the Mike Carroll Traveling Fellowship at UWA as a memorial to the late Mike Carroll in recognition of his devotion to agriculture, particularly the broad acre agriculture, and his tireless, selfless, and friendly efforts to improve a lot of farmers, the wide agriculture community, and his scientific discipline. I have also had the opportunity to work under his leadership when he was the Deputy Director General of the then Department of Agriculture and also as the uh, Director General of the Department of Agriculture and also when he was a consultant to GRDC. I remember some of his last emails to uh, various friends and colleagues. Uh, so he used to call me son. Uh, my first uh, meeting was in Geraldton uh, when he was the DDG, Deputy Director General uh, traveling through a uh, loop in field, those days, uh, John, John Hamblin around here, Rob Delane and others were doing a lot of work in uh, Lupins, and we were having before, at the dinner table, he said, oh, can anyone tell the yield of that particular genotype of Lupin you saw? It's a, Wallace, it's a determinate type, means topless, so it just produced a lot of pots. As a cheeky person, I went and counted the pots, and then I did a calculation so I said, oh, it will be the same as the other one because it shows off, but it doesn't yield that much. So then from that time onwards, there has been various uh, occasions I have been able to interact and communicate with uh, my, Michael Carroll. Now, the next slide. So that uh, clearly shows that the, the journey we had over the years, 2003, that was in Prescott Room. Robson, Alan Robson, he has sent his apologies. And also, Helen, our new Vice Chancellor, has sent his apologies for not being able to hear. So the other thing, if you look at that, uh, uh, in fact, we produced a booklet uh, last year. Uh, Cora, we may still have some of them. Uh, we went and contacted some of them. And all of them are doing wonderful. For example, Graham Duell is uh, doing, is a professor uh, in New Zealand, Martin Villa, Abu is uh, uh, from Argentina. He comes here. Now, pick up Annalise Mason, France. She has traveled all over the world. She went to uh, Germany, then she went to China, the Fellowship for Germany. Now, she's a full professor in one of the German universities. Um, Lalit Surya Gauda is doing extremely well in Sri Lanka. Um, and, and, and many others. Candy Taylor, for example, went to Czech Republic, and she's now uh, working with Wallace as a research fellow, part-time basis, and so on. So the fellowship has immensely benefited uh, all these people. And so I think this is the kind of thing we should look for, investing for the future. And that uh, three months, $5,000 or $6,000 we pay, 
uh, is enormous benefit to the students and to the university. So the aim of the fellowship is to support travel related to recipients' postgraduate research project, which will enhance their experience, knowledge of their chosen area of research. You will hear from three of them today. Three or two? Three, okay. I'm getting old. Postgraduate students are part of the fabric of this university. They contribute extensively to the university's research capability and uh, publications. For example, uh, this year again, 2020, uh, in agriculture science, we maintained our position number one in Australia and number 17 in the world. And then when you go and look at the analysis that's based on the papers, the citation, the, the high site, and so on, so the students do contribute, and that postgraduate cohort is so important for us now and in the future. So the Michael Traveling Fellowship is an excellent opportunity for the students to develop interstate and international linkages as well as enrich their student experience. As I mentioned, some examples, what are they doing? It's an interesting journey. I would like to acknowledge the sponsors of the fellowship. Uh, again, you know, a number of them are there, GRDC, the, the, the DEPERD, Department of Primary Industries, UWA, and individuals. Now it's my, my pleasure to introduce Helen, who will be chairing the session. Helen, please join. So I'm going to try it without glasses. Can you hear me at the back of the room? Great. Thank you, Bob. Well, good evening. No, I'll try my glasses. It is my pleasure to welcome you all this evening, including the following. Emeritus Professor Bob Linda, whose guidance and wise words have been very much appreciated. And Emeritus Professor David Lindsay, a longtime friend and colleague. I understand that Alan isn't available to come, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, including Michael's older brother, John. Now, before we start proceedings, I would like to express our condolences to Jill Lawson, whose husband, Eric, passed away almost a year um, ago. Now, Eric and Jill attended the inaugural Mike Carroll Fellowship back in 2003. Uh, Jill, by the way, uh, is the daughter um, of Professor Underwood, whose um, portrait hangs in the agricultural ring, wing of Western Australia. And secondly, I was going to ask you to turn your mobiles off, but that's already been done. And now... Um, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I do. Of you, WA. Thank you, sweet. <laughs> Nothing like family. <laughs> and I haven't even finished my champagne. <laughs> and now, on behalf of the selection committee, I have pleasure in announcing, except it's up on the board. <laughs> I have pleasure in introducing you to the winner of the Mike Carroll Travelling Fellowship for 2020, and it's Michael Young. And Michael, I haven't met you. Well, please join us, okay? Oh, please join us, Michael. Oh, it's okay. I'm going to stand and have a photograph taken. Is that possible?
um, we all know, Michael, that travel broadens the mind and a mind that is stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions. So we wish you safe travels, Michael, and keep healthy. Thank you. Okay. So now I would like to introduce Suyog Subadi, who was uh, one of the 2019 recipients of this fellowship. Uh, Suyog's PhD, please, please join us. Um, in his PhD studies are being supervised by Professor Phil Verko. Uh, do we have Phil? All oh, right. And Graham Martin. Okay. And in his travels, we will see Suyog worked along in the laboratory at the University of Copenhagen alongside Associate Professor Andrew Williams, who, by the way, gained his PhD from UWA. Right. UWA, Mario Wicks. <laughs> <laughs> Sue Og, um, I believe you are researching bioactive plants that can maintain sheep gut health by balancing gut flora and suppressing parasites and pathogenic bacteria, end of quote. Okay. <laughs> Associate Professor Andrew Williams runs projects with similar big picture goals. And your aim, CIOG, is to build a pathway to an important international collaboration between UWA and the University of Copenhagen. So please, can uh, you start with your presentation, and at the end, I will ask you a few questions if there is time. Is it okay if I sit here? Oh, that's fine. Okay. Actually, no, I won't sit here. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Suyuk Subedi. I'm from Nepal, a PhD student here. Uh, and I would like to start with a big thanks to the Carroll family for this opportunity, uh, which helped me travel to travel and work at the University of Copenhagen. I'd also like to thank my supervisor, Graham, Phil, Joey, and Steph. So, I'm actually working with a plant, a tree. It's called African mahogany, and it has been extensively uh, planted here in Australia for its timber. And I'm, I'm trying to see if this plant contains some natural compound that might uh, decrease the worm load and improve gut health in livestock. Just to give you an idea of uh, how big the problem with uh, uh, worm is, it's costing us almost $600 million every year. So that's a lot. So during the first half of my PhD, I was able to isolate certain fractions uh, uh, from, the, from the bark and uh, leaf of this plant, and to some extent prove that they are bioactive. But for a more confirmatory result, I needed a specific test, uh, which I was struggling to set up here at UWA. Uh, so I reached out to Dr. Andrew Williams, who is also a uh, UWA graduate, and they have a complete setup at their lab, and they agreed to help me. So I had my, oops, sorry. <laughs> so I had my compounds, the fractions. Uh, I got a lab to work at, and the fellowship provided me with the resource to travel, so perfect. So then I packed my stuff and flew to Copenhagen during the last week of February. But <laughs> things didn't pan out the way I expected. As soon as I was about to start my work, the pandemic hit. Europe was in chaos at that time. And then Denmark closed. So was my lab. And then I was asked to fly back to Australia. But before I could board the plane, Australia closed its border. Uh, then I tried to fly back to my own country, Nepal, but they were not letting in anyone, not even their own citizen. 
uh, and especially people traveling from Europe as it was the then hotspot. So I was literally stranded uh, in Europe at the middle of a pandemic. Uh, I spent four months in a room, oh, sorry, what happened? In a room in that hotel, four months. I was extremely worried, anxious, and was concerned for the well being of my family who were back here in Perth. I left behind my wife and a three month infant when I went there. My plan was just one or two months, but I got stranded. And then, after four months, I was sent back to Nepal. And I must say, flying during the pandemic was an experience on itself. <laughs> Those are the air hostess. Uh, but things were not just sad and gloomy. There was suddenly some positive out of this trip. There was a silver lining. There was some achievement. First, I learned a new technique, which we'll talk in the next slide. Second, we're able to forge a collaboration between UWA and University of Copenhagen, which in fact is a forerunner when it comes to animal par uh, parasitology, and there's a lot these two institutes can share. And I, I was also able to muster some interesting finding out of whatever work I was able to do there. So. For this kind of study, we need a specific parasite egg. Uh, and for that, what we generally do is we bring in young animals, inject them with corticosteroid to knock off their immune system, and then we infect them with parasite intentionally. And once they become sick, we harvest the egg and do the test. Now, this process is expensive, it's resource intensive, and it has to be coordinated precisely. However, this new technique saves you from all these hassles. You just need to go to a slaughterhouse, collect the parasite, and then harvest the egg, process it, and put it in the freezer. Whenever you need to test something, some compound, you just take it out, thaw it, hatch it, and you have a ready supply of larvae, something like those. Now, you count 100 of those larvae, 100 larvae, and put them in one of these wells in the plate, along with the test substance, whatever you're testing, and then incubate it. After 24 hours, you take it out and count the live and dead larvae. Uh, anyone that's still moving and curled up like those, they are live, and anything that's not moving, obviously, and straight, those are dead. Uh, in my case, and um, the more the potent your substance, uh, your um, test compound, the more larvae it will kill. In my case, fraction three and fraction four from that plant were able to kill almost 95% of the larvae. What that means is we have a plant here in Australia which has the potential to solve the one problem that's costing us almost $600 million annually. And that also in a clean, green and ethical way. How good is that? And I had all the time in the world to appreciate <laughs> Copenhagen. <laughs> I was stranded. So that's, that's the colorful townhouse uh, by the uh, canal. Beautiful. There was supposed to be a fountain, but they closed the water supply because there were no tourists at that time. Ah, that's a very famous Little Mermaid, yeah. And that was a view from my hotel room, not bad. <laughs> so now, what I'm planning to do is, I'm going to further purify those two fractions and send it back to the University of Copenhagen, and they will test it for me. In doing that, we hope to identify a compound or a group of compound which is responsible for the parasitic action. And if we could do that, that would be a great finding. And next, we, we're trying to replicate the same technique that I have learned here in UWA that won't just be beneficial to me, but to anyone who would want to study in the similar field in future. So finally, 
Despite all the trouble 2020 has to offer, there's suddenly some positive out of this trip. And the best one was when I finally got to meet my family after nine months. That's my daughter. She was three months when I left, almost a year now. They grow so fast. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the best part, uh, I think, is um, for this kind of study uh, in natural compound, we here at UWA has a very good uh, setup, our lab for chemical works, and they have very good parasitological lab over there. So if we, these two uh, university could collaborate, there's a lot we could uh, gain out of that. So I think that would be a highlight of my visit. Good evening, everyone. I'm Marie Louise, Michael's daughter, and happy to see everyone here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I understand we're on a tight time frame, so I'm going to just introduce the um, the next speaker, who is the 2018 recipient of this award. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Ukwe Zhang. Um, and Ukwe, I understand, travelled to the Czech Republic, um, where she worked under Professor Jaroslav Dolezel's, <laughs> Dolezel's laboratory. And he has a very impressive title, which I'll have to read out. He's the head of the Centre of Plant Structural and Functional, Structural and Functional Genomics at the Institute of Experimental Botany in in uh, Olomouc, I think is how you pronounce it, in the Czech Republic. So he sounds like a very interesting fellow. And um, I probably, I thought I might just mention tonight, because both the people that I'm sort of introducing have, both their projects involve canola. And I met this lovely lady in the drinks earlier, um, is it Natalie? Yes. And I was asking a bit about canola because you know, from my social studies <laughs> projects back in the day, it was all about wheat and barley and oats. Anyway, I understand canola is actually WA's third largest crop after wheat and accounts for nearly 50% of um, Australia's five-year, oh, hang on, the, yeah, of our five-year average production, 3.6 million, million tonnes. Um, and that, yeah, it's obviously a very important crop and the potential diseases that can affect it obviously can be devastating. So, um, Ukwe is now going to talk about some of the work she's done in around canola. Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jyoti. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Yue Qi. Um, thank, um, I'm one of the um, like coral recipients in 2018. I was lucky enough to um, did my own, own experiments and travel safely back to Perth before the pandemic started. So I'm very grateful <laughs> for the correct and perfect timing of the fellowship. Um, so thanks, thanks for my, my coral fellowship. I was able to conduct a single chromosome isolation in canola in Czech Republic. So my supervisors for this project include um, Jaroslav Dozel at the Institute of Experimental Botany of the Czech, Czech Academy of Science and Professor Jacqueline Batley um, from G Crop Genomics Group at UWA. Being a plant researcher, 
I did my Bachelor of Biotechnology with honors at Australian National University. Um, my honors project focused on an uh, important plant pathogen, um, which, which is, um, I did my honors under the supervision of Professor Adrian Hardham. This is the Linnaeus building I used to work in. Then I moved to UWA, um, University of Western Australia, thanks to my professor Jacqueline Batley. I worked on canola. This is the agricultural central wind, which where I have spent three years with my, um, Jackie's group. So um, in 2018, Jackie gave me an, an amazing research opportunity in Czech Republic, and she helped me apply the fellowship. Then I was able to conduct my experiment in Czech Republic, and, and it was my also my first time visiting Europe. After return from Czech Republic, um, it also my first. It was, it was also the first time my both mom and dad visited me um, in Perth, and we had a very great time. Both of them are very grateful and happy of, with all the opportunities I was given. Oh, so thanks, Jackie. <laughs> so the place I visited was the Center of Plant Structural and Functional Genomics in Onomok. Onomok is a city marked as red pack on, on the map. It's two hours by train from Prague, which is the capital city of Czech Republic. I spent, um, I spent seven months over there with um, Yaroslav's group. Yaroslav is the head of the center. This is the man over here in the lab, in the, in the lab photo. He is the world leading expert in chromosome genomics, um, yet he is probably the humblest and kindest scientist one can ever meet in their life. Um, most of the lab leaders in this, um, in this group fellow followed him since the establishment of the lab. They include um, Alish, Yan, Dave, Hannah, and another Yan. They all cluster around Yaroslav. You can see how closely they, they are there, their relationship as well as their, their work. And I was, um, thanks for the fellowship, I was able to um, conduct my experiments closely with this big group from March to um, September from, uh, in 2019. Yaroslav helped me with all the details of the experimental design and data analysis. Um, beyond that, I also obtained numerous technical support from um, Veronica, Mahamoud, Anna, Milka, and Itka. So their ex expertise is isolating chromosomes from, from plants. So plant genomes are very highly complex and duplicated. So an analogy would be, um, we all know that it's very difficult to assemble a jigsaw puzzle, which contain numerous identical pieces. So similarly, it's very difficult to assemble plant genome because many DNA pieces are, are, um, are identical. So one of the critical approach to tackle this complexity is to isolate part of the genome, such as individual chromosomes, using this advanced flow sorter. And then individual chromosomes can be sequenced and assembled to build a whole genome of the complex plant. So this approach has revolutionized the construction of complex genomes of barley, wheat, rye, sugarcane, pea, chickpea, and grass. However, Nobody has ever experimented on canola before because its chromosomes are super, super tiny. Um, that's how my project came in. In order to uh, isolate abundant chromosome from canola, we um, tested multiple, a combination of multiple um, chemicals to optimize the concentration as well as the, as well as the timing. So the chemicals we tested include an anti-cancer anti drug called hydroxyurea, um, also herbicides APM as well as orizaline, and even nitrous oxide, commonly known as laughing gas. So you can see the wide range of chemicals we tested in order to achieve our goal. So the exact labor, the exact experiment, oh gosh, what did I, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> so the experiment, exact experiment procedure was extremely laborious and complex. Um, here I would like to share with you my um, 
personal experience. In order to optimize exact t- timing and the concentration, I had to stay um, in the lab like from 8 p.m. After leave after leave lab after 8 p.m. and arrive before 6 a.m. Um, that lasted lasted for several uh, couples um, continuously multiple months and for several weeks I had to stay awake in the lab <laughs> um, to record the data on, on, on an hourly basis but I'm so grateful that Gareth's lab was always there to give me help and support and share his own rec- um, experience as a young scientist in the end we realized that canola is completely different from all the other well, su- well studied crop species so it took twice the amount of time to establish the more optimum condition for each individual steps. Thanks for the Coral Fellowship, I was able to extend my visit from three months to 10 months. So, um, so I'm very grateful for that. In the end, we managed to achieve the highest chromosome yield in canola for the first time. However, we encountered very serious issue on chromosome clumping. So chromosome clumping interfere with isolation of single chromosomes using the flow sorter, which have to be resolved. So we tried m- many different conditions, optimizing um, different chemical co- treatments. These are the results I would like to share with you. So with the, with the herbicide treatment APN or Isalian, it causes cr- uh, uniform chromosome clumps. An example is shown um, in the red square here. So you can see the chromosome clumps shows as a cluster of bright spot in the, under the microscope slides. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention those are the microscope slides of, of, of individual cells, and the bright spots and areas are the nuclei or the chromosomes. And this um, nitrous oxide or laughing gas has been successfully used to prepare abundant, well spread metaphase chromosomes in grass. However, it was toxic to canola, so only a few well-spread chromosomes are produced. So one of, one of the examples is shown in the green square here. You can see the two contrasting conditions here. So well, in well-spread chromosomes, the individual chromosomes are well-spread and separate apart, and then imagine we can isolate them and flow sort them through using the machine. Instead, most of the time, we, we, that's what we, we've got through experiments. So up until here, it was um, nine months. I, w- I was very, uh, we, 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 wish, we really wish to pursue further, but we have to end because of the unprecedented technical challenge. Beyond the project itself, I was able to explore Europe for the first time. My lovely supervisor, Jackie, invited me to the, fir- the third agriculture and climate change conference in Budapest in March, as well as the 15th International Rapeseed Congress in Berlin in June. In addition, I also went to the fourth Green and Sustainable Chemistry Conference in, in Dresden in May. I was deeply impressed by the um, amazing and ma- magnificent architectures in Europe, <laughs> um, especially those cathedrals and churches. They are just amazing. Um, here, I would like to share with you some amazing pictures. This is the Holy Trinity Column, St. Wenceslas, St. Barbara's Co- um, tr- um, Co- um, Cathedral in Czech Republic. This is the Parliament House in um, Budapest, Berliner Dome in Berlin, and um, Zwingli Palace in Dresden. Yeah, they are very beautiful. All of this achievement should be attributed to um, those lovely people. So Yaroslav from Czech Republic, Jackie, Dave, Philip from UWA. Also, most importantly, thanks to, thanks to the Mac Coral Fellowship for their financial support. Thanks very much for your attention. the uh, final recipient um, and that is uh, Suda Chenaz, the, um, the 2019 recipient who travelled to Japan to be part of Dr. Fujimoto's and Dr. Takumu's groups at Kobe University um, to expand her research objectives and I'd just like to acknowledge her supervisors 
um, Professors Jacqueline Batley, Martin Barbetti and David Edwards. Thank you. My name is Sude, I'm, I'm very excited to share some of my uh, experience and also achievement from my travel to uh, Japan, which was great. So before I start, I would like to uh, thank uh, my Carol family and friends for their generous uh, contribution to establishing the My Carol uh, Traveling Fellowship, which gives me a great opportunity to actually travel to Japan and uh, study and work in two universities and then <clears throat> which it was uh, impossible for me to do without the support of the my carol uh, traveling fellowship and uh, i also would like to thank uh, committee in institute of agriculture for the recognition of my work and granting me this award and also my great supervisor jackie martin and dave which support me and helps me and encourage me all through my phd and also travel and Everything just was a great success for me uh, from all aspects. And also Rio and Shohi, who actually host me in Japan and uh, helped me and support me during my stay and uh, my work in their lab. So just uh, a little bit about myself. I'm originally, uh, I'm, oh, no, not that one. Okay. Uh, I'm originally from Iran and uh, the city Kerman in the south. And then I moved to Esfahan uh, for my bachelor degree. I did my bachelor degree in agriculture and plant pathology. And then I moved to Tehran for my master degree. I did my master degree in plant pathology in a biotechnology institute in Iran. And after my master degree, I got married. And because my husband job, we moved to Dublin. I was there for a year. And then uh, in 2013, again, because his job, we moved to Perth, and uh, then I started working as a graduate research assistant in UWA from 2013 to 16. And in 2016, I joined Jackie's group for my PhD and starting uh, working on plant genomics. So, by support of the My Carol uh, Traveling Fellowship, I had the chance to visit two groups in Japan. The first one was in Kobe between the Dr. Ryo Fujimoto and the second one was in a graduate university for advanced study with uh, Dr. Shohi Takuno. They themselves called the university Sokendai. And uh, each stay was uh, around three weeks. So the whole travel was actually had a huge impact on my research and my PhD. The original aim of my uh, PhD was identification of resistant genes and then a study of the defense regulatory mechanism of the canola in response to the black leg disease. But after traveling to the Japan, we found that there is a chance to expanding the experiment even further. So in addition to canola and in addition to canola and black leg disease, I also work on Japanese spinach and white rice disease and I also study how the mechanism and work in the Japanese spinach in uh, response to the white rice disease as well. So in general, plants are under a lot of stresses, like a heat, cold, or pests, or viruses. And then in plant, a lot of uh, regulatory mechanism happens to just, uh, at, you know, to just control the pressure and see what's going on and just uh, be survive, you know? And so in this process, a lot of genes are getting on and off and on and off. And based on the, what the genes are getting on and off, so it is the resistance is for unsusceptible response. My PhD mainly had the focus on the fun fungal pathogens, and also I study how this regulatory mechanism actually control the uh, like a resistant response that further we can use them in the breeding program and uh, resistant improvement of the crops. So it is the main thing I've done in Japan. So we work on the Japanese espionage uh, and uh, in the two cultivars, one susceptible and one uh, resistant to the um, white rust. And so the plant material were already provided with the Fujimoto lab. 
and then I've done for the three weeks there all the laboratory procedures. But it was quite busy three weeks, but we managed to finish them because he's a student also helping me through that. So we, it was almost three of us doing the whole experiment. So we managed to finish that. And then it, uh, we ended up with a huge amount of data to analyze. So for the data analysis, I moved to the Takuna labs. So he actually taught me how to do the analysis for three weeks because it was like eight set of data. We couldn't finish them in the three weeks. And then after I learned that, I bring them the data back here and finish the analysis and writing the manuscript and paper and everything. So as in picture, you can see here, there is one column like, for example, for susceptible cultivars and the other one for resistant. And if they are red, it means the genes are getting on and if it is under pressure. And if it is black, it means they are off. And what's interesting for us, it is where they are actually different. For example, this block here or this block here. And then we take this further and see what are these genes, what are the function, and actually how we can use them in the like a breeding program and resistant improvement of the crops. So as I mentioned, it was like a, a great opportunity, opportunity for me because I learned the new technique. The, um, the experiment I've done in the Fujimoto lab, it was new. We haven't done it before here. And so I, I actually learned that. I, if we wanted to do it here, so I can just use my experience and for setting up everything. And also the data analysis was all new to me. I also learned them very well, I hope so. And uh, then I had, oh, sorry. And then I had the chance to presenting my research in both university in their internal seminar series. And I received a lot of feedbacks and suggestions on my research that was great too. And also visiting other research group, especially in Kobe University, because there were many other research groups that working on the plant resistance and this, you know, similar fields. So I actually had the chance to um, visit them, talk to them, and discuss my research with them as well. And uh, also, I think uh, the results were very nice, and we are hoping to publish them very soon. And uh, actually, they, uh, they are my chapter four of my thesis which I also received the examiner comments. They were all very good, very happy, just positive comments. They didn't ask for anything else, which is really great. And uh, also, we are looking for uh, continuing our collaboration because uh, the plants are a regulatory mechanism. And what we are doing is very similar to what they are doing over there. And we are expanding our research uh, to other uh, crops or other regulatory mechanism to see how actually these things may work. And so apart from all the scientific and the academic aspect, I really, really enjoyed my life over there. It was really fun. And I actually, it was quite a surprise, few surprise for me as well. The first thing uh, was, uh, for example, here when a new student joined the group, usually the student in the third year or fourth year just helping him or the postdoc just helping to settle in and learning. But in Japan, uh, it is uh, by supervisor. So it doesn't matter how experiment is simple or how, what is the step, they need to do everything for the student and all the students follow the supervisor taking notes and observing and then they actually allow to do the experiment themselves. For example, yeah, here he's Rio doing the experiment, two of his students and me just following him like for a few days and observing what he's doing and taking notes and everything and then after that we actually allow to do the experiment ourselves. That, that was quite a surprise to me. Because even back in Iran, it wasn't like that. Usually, we just learn from like a student from the, like a third year or fourth year or something like that. And uh, the second shock to me was previously, I know that in Japan, in some places, when you are going, you have to take off your shoes, but not in laboratory. Like here, because of the safety issue, we cannot go to the labs with the sandals or something like that. But over there, at the first day, they asked me, no, you cannot go to the lab with the shoes. You have to take off your shoes and go into the lab with the sandals. And I said, oh, no, really? <laughs> so because they are working with a lot of, of chemicals and sharp things, and I said, oh, really, it's safe to go into the lab with the, like, the sandals? And they said, yeah, we are all doing that. And yeah, after a few days, you actually get used to it. But it wasn't very comfortable, to be honest. <laughs> And uh, the second and the third one uh, took my attention uh, was their uh, like uh, bean system. 
So they were very uh, pay attention to the environment and everything, especially in the second university I stay. So it was uh, their beans, and I, I didn't took the picture, but it was three pages of the protocols, how we prepare our rubbish for putting them in the beans. And they were mainly in the Japanese, just a little bit of the English on the side. And I, uh, for a few days, I oh no, what should I do with my rubbish? <laughs> and then I asked them, okay, I have these uh, with beans I have to use, and how I can just prepare them and put them in the beans. Yeah, it was quite super. Like uh, in the Kobe, it wasn't that complicated, but the second place, they were very careful about everything, I think, yeah. And as you can see, I had a lot of fun over there, very, very friendly and nice people. They almost took me for the lunch every day. And uh, we, uh, we also had uh, doing some uh, Japanese play after the works in the office. And uh, also uh, Rio took me a lot for the sightseeing in the city of Nara. And also he took me at the night for the uh, Kobe view, like uh, in top of the Rocco mountain. It's one of the highest mountain in Kobe. And it has a very nice view of the Kobe. I, think I, I will show the picture later on. But uh, he also took me there. And this is the picture, and I'm sure you all know the, how beautiful is Japan. But this is the picture of the second university. It was also on top of the mountain. And if the sky was clear, I actually had the chance to see the Mount Fuji from the university. This, this spot here, it is it. And the whole three weeks I was there, only three days this happened. And the sky was clear, and it's just a shadow of the Mount Fuji. I, I can see, but, but it was amazing. It was like a huge, my camera wasn't good, but uh, with the eyes, it was really great. And there is no doubt I enjoyed food a lot. A lot of sushi and romance. I really miss them, especially romance. And yeah, this is the night view of the Kobe from Rocco Mountain, which was great. And thanks again for the opportunity and also listening. Thank you. Well, you have heard from the from the students, and uh, you can see that uh, the money was uh, well uh, worth spending, uh, and uh, and the students have done a great job. And uh, your thesis is already passed. You said that that's a key. congratulations, uh, and the papers are on on the way. So that collaborative papers mean a lot to to the university. Universities like Kobe, uh, you know, there's Nobel Prize winners walk around everywhere. <coughs> And the same with Nagoya. We have six Nobel Prize winners in Nagoya uh, University. The, you know, the lead light, for example. So that's in the physics department. You walk around, you will just uh, tumble with the Nobel Prize winner. So I think this is excellent with Europe, with, uh, with uh, Japan. And that's what the universities want. And I hope uh, we'll be able to publicize that a bit more widely uh, through our uh, newsletter and tweeting so that our vice chancellor and others see that. Now, I would like to acknowledge the work put in by the committee members. Um, that's Helen, uh, David, David Chattel, uh, myself, and Cora supporting us. So when we were going for this year's thing, Cora comes and says, oh, this year probably we'll not do it because of the COVID. And of course, uh, uh, Helen also was saying that we may. I just pushed on and said, let's do it. You know, if the COVID is there, we may have to manage that well. And it was good that we also organized this function because you see that 2018, 2019, and 2020. So we are now up to date, uh, Ellen. And, uh, and I always look forward for this, um, this uh, meeting where we look at the candidates, quality, quality, quality. And that is very sad because we could have funded two or three, and we were always tossing who is the best person to do it, and they were touch and touch. So, what it means is that uh, we are okay in terms of, at the moment, the finance. As you know, the biggest funds, we cannot touch the capital. The capital remains, and that's being um, put it into high interest earning account by our endowment department. We don't, they won't even tell us. So then they uh, give us part of the interest for uh, giving to the candidates. So one way is that we are always looking for topping up that uh, bequest. So if uh, anyone, any of you or friends who want to 
contributes something, what it does is that it goes to the endowment fund and then that goes to the long-term interest. And I think, again, I really enjoyed this. I have been involved with uh, all, all those years in terms of uh, uh, this uh, fellowship and it is uh, spent on a worthy cause and we have a control on that as well. So I won't tell that very loudly in the university, but uh, that is something which we have the control and uh, no money is spent on any other thing apart from that. And also I would like to thank uh, people who worked behind the scene. I don't do much work. I just uh, sit in my office and, 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 and uh, get awards and so on. So, but uh, certainly uh, people like Cora is so meticulous about things. And if one person is more coming, they say, no, you can't have because of the COVID. And we had a discussion and debate about changing the venue from the common room to here. Then Rosanna Candler, stand up and let everyone see you. <coughs> Rosanna, Rosanna is our new communication officer, so she's putting her own touch in everything what we do. And of course, Diana, our old communication officer, she has now moved on to bigger and better things within the university. And then my colleagues, uh, the associate uh, directors, uh, uh, Professor Wallace Cowling is here. And in fact, Phil Verko would have been here, especially when there is a drink. He always comes there. But uh, he is somewhere in Coral Bay doing real work. Uh, and uh, so he's a lucky one. So he has sent apologies again. Now, um, so that's now our next event. This is our last event uh, this year. So it looks like last uh, two, three months we have been very busy because of the COVID. And uh, kindly, uh, the, this year's Hector and Andrew Stewart Memorial Lecture will be done by uh, Dr. Graham Robertson. And that will be at the, um, what lecture theater? Ross, Ross Lecture Theatre, and we will send you, and uh, there are some more seats available. Cora says no more seats, but uh, I think, Mick, you can come. No worries. <laughs> so Graham is definitely uh, getting a little bit nervous when I, when I spoke to him. He's not here today, so I can say whatever I like. So when I talked to him, he said, oh, no, 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 I don't need to. I then rang him three times and twisted his arms, and yes, you have to do it. Now I think Graham is excited about it. We're going to hear some wonderful, um, message from Graham on that. So those who want to come, let us know. Once again, thank you very much for attending this evening. And your continued support is very much appreciated by the students, the committee, and the sponsors of this fellowship award. We hope to see you here next time, especially next year, and with more fellowship. Perhaps we may give for two if there are a number of good candidates. Now that's the formal part. We're going to enjoy some drinks and some finger foods outside. Thank you. <laughs>